Okay, so today we are going to take one last look at the problem of scheduling. Uh, keep in mind that what I am doing over here is just, like I said earlier, not covering all possible different methods of scheduling or even most of the significant algorithms that are well known. The aim is to essentially present the problem to you and hopefully impress the importance of the problem, right? And show you one or two techniques by which we could potentially solve it. In practice, however, what is usually done is there are compilers that have much better algorithms that are more, more precisely heuristics, not algorithms, not precise algorithms that are implemented that can basically take care of automatically doing the scheduling for you. So why do you need to know the problems behind scheduling and in fact the methods of scheduling and so on so that when you finally see the output coming from the compiler, you understand, you at least get a picture of what might be happening behind the scenes why it might be going wrong, why it's not giving you the best possible result and how you could potentially change your input to get better results out of it. So we are going to take another look at the problem that we had yesterday. So I'm just going to once again redraw that task graph corresponding to the differential equation solver. This is essentially what it looked like. There were a total of 11 nodes. I'm going to leave out the variables used for the inputs and so on and just concentrate on the node IDs themselves. So what we can see is there are a total of 11 operations, 6 of which are multiplications, 5 are ALU operations, either additions, subtractions or comparisons. Right? To simplify matters, I am going to right now assume a problem of homogeneous processors right? all operations can be executed on a given processor. and further assume the unit delay model which means that any operation that gets scheduled on a processor completes after one clock cycle. So just the cycle in which it is scheduled is the cycle during which that processor is busy with that operation. In the next cycle it is free to do something else. Okay. So one way by which we could systematically put down a possible solution for this is First of all, let's start by putting what is the limit that we want. Okay, we need something in order to constrain our search space, right? <coughs> Otherwise, in general, if I say, okay, you know, I'm not putting a constraint on the latency, I'm not putting a constraint on the resources, the number of possibilities is essentially infinite, okay? And is also somewhat meaningless. I mean, it just means that you can pretty much put anything that doesn't violate the dependencies and you are done. But obviously, that's not what we are interested in. We want we are interested in the cases where we are putting some kind of constraints or limits on the either the amount of time that can be taken or the number of resources that are available. Okay, So the first thing that we can see over here is I do have a fundamental limit that I cannot finish this on these kind of processors in less than 4 clock cycles. Why is that? Because the critical path is 4 time units. right? Now, in, to make my scheduling problem a little bit easier, I am going to introduce one dummy sync node. Right? I had mentioned this briefly yesterday. Here I am going to make it explicit. I will basically call this as whatever the sync node. I will give it ID number 12. Uh, this is not necessary. And put arrows from all the other terminating nodes to this one. Right? Why am I putting dashed lines? Because they are not really dependencies. They are not true dependencies. They have been introduced only for the purpose of the scheduling problem. Okay. 
and more importantly as far as i am concerned all that it really means is as soon as operation number 12 is scheduled it means that i have completed my entire schedule for the rest of the system okay and more importantly let's say that operation 12 is scheduled in time step t it means that the actual latency is t minus 1 right because all the required operations have been scheduled at least one step before that because 12 can start only after all the other dependencies have completed okay so 12 is introduced purely for the purpose of scheduling and will be discarded at the end and in fact one clock cycle will be reduced from the latency to just account for that okay so with that in mind what i can now say is i am now interested in let's say i want to find a schedule for these operations that finishes within five time steps okay including operation 12 that's the minimum that i can target okay so what i'll say is let's say t 1 2 3 4 5 i'm starting from 1 now instead of from 0 in general you know i mean i'm sometimes you are starting from 1 so sometimes starting from 0 it doesn't really matter right usually it's clear from the context what i am implying over there so if there is any confusion let me know but otherwise it should be fairly clear in each case what is being done what i'm going to do is essentially create a grid right and on the vertical axis what i have is the operation number this is operation 1 operation 2 operation 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 and i also have 12 okay and what i'm going to do is introduce some variables right i'll call this x11 x12 x13 etc okay so this will be x21 x31 and so on up to x121 right so please keep in mind that x12 is different from x12 right i'm just using a simplified notation here and finally what i have over here is x15 up to x125 okay so these x's are essentially dummy variables that i have introduced right new variables i'm not calling them dummies they are just essentially some variables that i have introduced over here that should hopefully help me with my scheduling problem okay what kind of constraints can i now put on the values of the x's that is primarily what i am interested in okay and the goal that i am trying for over here is if i can put a sufficient number of constraints or you know numerical constraints equations if i can write down a bunch of inequalities or equations over here that capture all the constraints that need to be satisfied right then maybe i have i can convert this and essentially now that what that means is i need to solve for a set of x values okay and there are ways of doing it because there are other techniques that are known techniques for solving systems of linear inequalities more importantly given a set of linear inequalities and one cost function i can optimize that that cost function subject to all of those linear inequalities that is essentially the area of mathematics called linear programming okay in our case we have one further constraint which is that it's not generally linear programming i am going to further insist that the x values should take on integers they cannot be 1.5 for example okay so now let me look at what i am implying by the use of these x values right essentially what i'm going to say is that any x ij must be either 0 or 1 it can take on only two values okay and another term that is sometimes used to identify such variables is that they are called indicator variables right and you can think of it this way if any xij is equal to 1 that indicates that operation number i is going to execute in time step j that essentially is what it means right so that's why the term indicator variable okay so 
what xij equal to 1 implies is that operation number i is going to execute in time step j right good so can you now think of one inequality or equality that i can write corresponding to this row for operation 1 is there anything I can say about the values x11, x12, x13, x14 and x15? <coughs> the sum must be exactly equal to 1. Why? Because the operation has to be scheduled. Okay, It has to be scheduled in either step 1, step 2, step 3, step 4 or step 5. Okay, So the simplest constraint that I can write over here is sigma x1j is equal to 1 or in general for any operation sigma xij is equal to 1 ok now there are a few further things that you can probably write over here which is that you can probably just look at the graph and say that look x1 I mean operation 1 cannot be in time step 5 because time step 5 is reserved for that dummy node that I introduced at the end that's ok the point is we can think of how to simplify this and reduce the number of constraints or the reduce the type of constraints further but at least this captures exactly what I need, right? So in general, sigma xij right, over all time steps is equal to 1 for all i. What does that mean? Every operation has to be scheduled in exactly one time step. Okay. So the xij actually indicates the starting time step. When you have unit delay, it also indicates the ending time step. But in general, it's used to indicate when the operation starts. Okay, Which is why we can very clearly say that at any given point in time, sigma xij must be equal to 1. When I sum over the time steps, that is to ensure that every operation is going to be scheduled. Okay. Can I say anything about a sum across a column. What does this indicate? If I take one time step and add up all the xij's across it, what does that give me? The number of operations that have been scheduled into that time step. Okay, which basically gives me the number of processors that are required for that time step. Okay, so this is number of ops ops in time step 1 is equal to number of processors required in time step 1. Okay. So, right now let us uh, you know uh, uh, right now I will just leave it at that and then tell you how we will make use of that later. The next thing that I need to worry about is constraints right what constraints the dependency constraints. So for example I have a dependency between 1 and 3 that is only after 1 completes 3 can start. How do I capture that dependency? I need to know the actual time instant at which 1 has been scheduled right. So just having the indicator variables is not sufficient. But how can I convert that indicator variable into the actual value, the time instant at which it has been scheduled? In other words, is there an expression that I can get for Ti? actual starting time of operation i right i could sort of go through all the xij's and find out which xij is equal to 1 and that j is what i'm looking for okay but can i write it down as an expression i don't want to i mean i i know how to do it but i would like to write it out as a mathematical expression that can then be used in a constraint so what did I say? I essentially need to go through all the j values and find out that particular j value for which xij is equal to 1. Exactly. 
right so it's a summation of j into x i j right summation over j okay so essentially what this means is x i j is equal to 1 only for one of those j values that particular j value is the one that's going to come out okay now if i have ti is equal to this then i can essentially say uh, let me just change the terminology i'm going to make this l so that i can then write tj is equal to summation over l l into x j l right so then i can write tj minus ti greater than or equal to d i j which is the delay of the operation from i to j that is basically operation i in this case it's equal to 1 right so then i can write summation l x j l minus summation l x i l is greater than or equal to 1 okay so effectively this is what i have i have one set of constraints here that is just the schedulability of a given node and constraints here which says the data dependencies and finally if I am looking at the particular problem that I am interested in a resource constraint schedule that is I have a limit on the maximum number of resources that I can use right sigma x i j sum over i for a given j this will give you r j right the number of resources used at time step j must be less than or equal to sum r this is my resource constraint so this first constraint is talking about schedulability has the operation been scheduled at all or not this is data or task dependency and this is resource constraint okay so these three sets of constraints they are not individual constraints they are actually each one is a set right so this first one the schedulability is for all i for every task it has to be scheduled the data dependency is for every edge i to j there will be one such constraint and the resource constraint is for every time step there will be one such constraint okay and what i finally have is subject to all of these constraints what do i want to do i want to define some kind of a cost function okay supposing i consider my problem as resource constrained minimum latency scheduling okay if it's resource constrained minimum latency then one thing i can say for sure if i just put the maximum latency this value over here as 5 then i am looking at the minimum theoretical latency right in other words i am basically targeting the critical path itself there's obviously no way i can go below that but then it probably does not make sense to talk about a resource constraint i can't really put a resource constraint on it okay uh, yeah whereas if i change the problem around a little bit and say okay rather than 5 I go up to some lambda plus 1 right where what is lambda it could be 10 it could be 20 it could be some number that I just come up with okay I only need to make sure that it is sufficiently large that I can guarantee that there will be a solution with the resource constraints that I am applying right and then basically try and solve for it so for example let's say that 
can you think of a value of lambda for which no matter what my resource constraint i will always be able to schedule this what is it there should be at least one time step for every operation right so lambda equal to 11 is sufficient as long as lambda is at least 11 it means that no matter which way you schedule the operations i have enough time to schedule all the operations because any operation once scheduled finishes within one clock cycle you need to delay right so lambda equal to 11 or in other words the sum of the execution times of all the units essentially corresponds to putting all of them on a single processor okay lambda equal to 4 so that lambda plus 1 equal to 5 is the minimum possible that's the critical path okay and lambda equal to let's say 6 or 8 or something of that sort will give me something in between it might allow me to do it with fewer resources than the asap or elap schedule but at the same time i may not be able to bring it all the way down to a single resource in fact i cannot bring it down to a single resource okay so as long as i can choose some value of lambda choose a sufficiently large lambda right and then what should my cost function be this should be the actual latency right so the cost function that i am trying to optimize is the actual latency after scheduling all the operations right assuming that all the constraints have been satisfied okay how do i find this latency given all the indicator variables that i have over here is there some expression that i can write which would actually give me the latency exactly right i am basically interested in t12 that is when the dummy operation is scheduled right and t12 itself i have an expression for that okay so i can basically write down a cost function this is also a linear combination of the xi variables now right so my cost function itself so now let's go back and look briefly at this the first expression summation xij over all j is equal to 1 that is a linear combination of the xijs it's just a summation right linear combination means some ai times aij xij summation of aij xij for over all j or i or whatever it is right should be less than or equal to some value some constant that is a set is a is an example of a linear constraint or a linear inequality in this case it's a linear equality this one the data task dependencies that i have over here is actually a set of linear inequalities right the summation lx jl minus summation lx il must be greater than or equal to 1 that is once again a linear combinations of the x ijs must be greater than or equal to or i could equivalently write it as must be less than or equal to some constant where again the constant is independent of the xij values okay the resource constraint also has the same kind of behavior right the summation of xijs over i that is over all the operations for a given time step must be less than or equal to the resource total resource maximum resource constraint okay so i have got a set of linear inequalities and i have got a got a cost function which is again a linear combination of the xijs okay so effectively what i have is a linear program <coughs> 
which says optimize the cost function while satisfying all the inequalities equalities i'm treating as a special case of inequalities right i mean you can it's it's essentially a slightly tighter constraint but it's a constraint nevertheless the same kind of behavior okay and in general for a linear program this is fine we know methods for solving it right in school you would probably have come across this thing called the simplex method the simplex method is the most common method used for solving linear programs right you essentially construct some kind of a polytope right a intersection of planes usually we would do it for like two variables so you can actually do it graphically find out the intersection points over there one of those has to be the optimum etc etc standard method is there okay there's one catch the catch over here is the xijs have to be integers okay so the additional constraint is xijs must take on integer values in particular they should actually be 0 1 right either 0 or 1 but it turns out that even if you relax that constraint that they should be exactly 0 or 1 and just allow them to be integers the behavior is pretty much the same right you can still solve the problem in the same way more importantly it turns out that integer linear programming where you have this constraint that your variables that you are solving for have to be integers is an np hard problem okay and in general the word used for that is to say that there it's a intractable problem intractable is just a word used to indicate that this is computationally hard it's not that it's impossible to solve you can but the time taken for it is very likely to run into exponential time uh, relative to the cost of the operations that you have and the number of operations that you have okay so then why did we go through this why did we you know basically go about this entire scheduling problem and try to cast it as an integer linear program simple reason it's basically to show that this is a very general framework okay i can take on pretty much any kind of set of operations number of time steps dependencies etc and frame an appropriate set of constraints that need to be solved okay what i have talked about over here is the so called resource constraint minimum latency scheduling problem there is a dual problem of that which is latency constraint minimum resource okay so over there what i would do is my cost function rather than saying i want to minimize the latency would actually say i want to minimize the maximum rj that i get at any given point in time okay so effectively the maximum value of rj must be minimized that is the minimum resource subject to a latency constraint both of those problems can be solved more or less in the same framework by appropriately defining a cost right if you think about it a bit further you will realize that that constraint that we put in for unit delay essentially says makes life easier in terms of writing these constraints but if i wanted to say it's not unit delay i can still take that into account pretty much what i would say over here is in this place i could insert a non unit delay and it would take care of that the problem is counting the number of resources that are used in a given time step becomes a bit more tricky because in the present formulation i could just basically do a summation on a given time step find out which are all the xijs that are non zero add them up and that tells me how many resources are active in the general case if a resource has been scheduled at time xij then it is busy from time xij up to xij plus di minus 1 where di is the delay of operation i right so let's say it takes 3 clock cycles xij xij plus 1 xij plus 2 are all busy okay in spite of all that those are at the end of the day those are complications but they are not impossible to capture as constraints they can be done okay 
Bottom line is, this is a very general kind of framework that can be extended to almost any kind of scheduling problem. And once you can pose the problem in this way, if you are able to solve it, it actually gives you the optimal solution. Okay. The problem is, ILP itself is intractable, therefore, there's no guarantee that you'll be able to find an optimal solution fast. Okay. But it is still a very valuable way of sort of posing a problem, both to understand what makes it hard as well as what are the ways by which you might go about solving it, if you had the time and the patience to actually go through with it. Okay. So let's now move on from there and say, all right, if I can't do ILP, what is done in practice? What are the other techniques that I could use in reality? Right? And one of the most popular is a technique that is called list scheduling. Sometimes it is also called priority list based scheduling or some other variant of this, right? The priority list based scheduling is the more accurate name. List scheduling is just a sort of contraction of that form, right? Effectively, what it is saying is, you know, I'm just going to prepare a list of operations that are ready to execute at any given point in time, order them according to some priority, pick them out as and when I want, as and when something is ready to execute them and let them run. Okay. The best way to illustrate this is to sort of use an example. So I'm going to schedule the differential equation task graph under a constraint of three processors, right? Where I'll assume that the processors themselves are homogeneous, which means that multiplication, addition, subtraction, comparison can all be done on the same processor with unit delay, okay? So the way that I would go about doing this is, I create something called a ready list and I maintain time, right? So I have time 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. And at any given point in time, I am going to maintain which are all the operations that are ready to execute and decide which of them are going to execute on my hardware, okay? In terms of this, I can then go to the graph and basically look at the ones that have no dependencies. What are all the operations? 1, 2, 6, 8 and 10. None of them have any dependencies within this iteration to start with. So I can put all of them into the ready list right at the start. Okay. Now what I need to do is pick some of them and schedule them for execution in time step one. Right? Now, just for illustration, I am going to intentionally choose them in a not so good order. Right? And I am basically going to say I am going to pick these three and schedule them. The point I am trying to make is, in principle, you could pick any of the ready items in order to schedule, right? You might feel that the priority based on the critical path or something else is the most important one and that is what needs to be satisfied. But in reality, that may also not be the one which is always optimal, okay? So if I did not have such a priority list and all I had was that everything has that is ready has the same priority, I could have picked 6, 8 and 10 as the operations to be scheduled. What that implies is, that 6, 8 and 10 will get executed in time step 1, right? Now what's the ready list in time step 2? 1 and 2 remain there, okay? Because 6 has executed in step 1, now 7 is ready. Because 8 has executed, 9 is ready. Because 10 has executed, 11 is ready. Okay. Once again, nothing really preventing me from picking these. 
so I would then end up with 7 9 and 11 over here right what happens after that it turns out that now I am stuck with only 1 and 2 being ready because nothing new came out of 7, 9 and 11 being executed. Okay, Schedule both of them. And what I get is 1 over here, 2 over here. It doesn't matter whether I put it on P1 or P2 or P3. But after they are done, 3 will be ready. Execute that. 4 will be ready in the next step. And finally, 5 will be ready over here. Okay. The good thing about this algorithm, by algorithm I mean the sequence of steps to be followed for solving the problem, is that it is very simple to describe and very simple to implement. All that I need to do is have some kind of a set data structure which keeps track of what are all the ready items okay and I need to pick as many of them as there are free processors at that given point in time and schedule them okay if I had a situation where some processors take more than one clock cycle to finish that's also easy when I go on to the next time step I just keep track of the processors also are they busy or are they free and just keep track of how many operations are ready how many processors are free to start a new operation and just pick and choose and push them over there right obviously this was not a very good schedule but fixing it is also in this case at least very trivial I could have just changed it around and said if I chose another scheduling set then I would have ended up with something like this in step 1 I would have got 1, 2 and 6 right and ok I need to get the ready list over here so to start with 1, 2, 6, 8, 10 would be ready <coughs> let me switch back to black itself So what I would do in this case is that I would pick these three and put them here, right? In the next time step what I would have is 8 and 10 are ready but in addition to that because 1 and 2 have executed, 3 also becomes ready and because 6 has executed, 7 also becomes ready, okay? Once again, keeping the critical path, etc. in mind, probably what I should do is pick these. 3 and 7 at least I need to make sure get scheduled because those are the ones that have other things depending on them. Right? So I would then say 3, 7, 10. Right? Where does that leave my ready list? 8 still remains on the ready list. Because 3 has completed, 4 now comes into the picture. Because 10 has executed, <coughs> 11 now comes into the picture ok all three of them can be scheduled and what I will end up with is 8, 4 and 11 over here which yeah and once I have done that in time step 4 what are the ones that are going to be ready because 8 executed 9 will now be on the list because 4 executed, 5 will now be on the list, right? Remember that 5 had two things that it depended on, right? 5 depended on 4 and 7. So just when 7 alone executed was not enough to put 5 onto the ready list, only after 4 also executed does 5 go onto the ready list. And in this case, finally what we have is in time step 4, I will end up with 9 and 5 and the whole thing basically completing within 4 time steps. 
whereas this original one took six time steps right so what you can see over here is creating this list and using it in order to schedule is a fairly simple and straightforward process how you create that priority that is how do you decide which operation that is on the ready list is important and should go next will ultimately determine how good your scheduling becomes okay once again the example that i have given over here is for the specific case of resource constrained minimum latency right because i basically told you that there are three processes so there is a resource constraint and then then asking you to minimize the latency okay if i wanted to do the opposite which was latency constrained and then minimum resource that is slightly more tricky because basically what i will have to end up doing is sort of you know try with a given set of resources see whether i am able to meet the time uh, latency constraint if i can't then maybe i have to change that latency constraint or change the number of resources right until eventually i am able to schedule everything within the resource uh, latency constraint that i need okay but there are heuristics that do that as well so the actual compilers that we'll be using later actually make use of these kind of techniques right in order to decide what operation goes into which scheduling step right but we are not going to be looking into the details of how they work there are a lot of other sort of details that also come into this right in particular there is one thing that can be done in certain situations which is depending on the type of hardware that you have you might have a situation where you can actually chain operations together an operation chaining essentially means let's say that you had operation 8 and 9 there was a multiplication followed by an addition if i instead had one hardware unit that can do a mac multiply accumulate i might be able to put both onto one hardware unit and finish both the multiplication and addition within a single clock cycle okay that depends on the type of hardware that you have so the task graph by itself cannot tell you whether or not chaining is possible it depends on the type of hardware that you have the second thing that actually determines this is even if you have the necessary hardware will you be able to do it subject to the time constraint that you have right in other words let's say that i want this entire thing to operate at a clock period of 20 nanoseconds i might find that chaining two operations together into a single clock cycle is easy to do but if i had to do it with a clock period of 2 nanoseconds i might find that it's very hard to do and i have to basically pipeline the multiplier and adder separately and i can't chain two of them into a single clock cycle okay this is something you can actually observe when you use vivado hls for synthesis as you change the timing constraint you will find that the hardware resource usage increases the type of pipelining that it does changes it basically tries to chain operations into a single clock cycle when possible and if it can't then it put them schedule them across multiple cycles use up more hardware more clock cycles but still try and give you a correct result okay so this ends our discussion of scheduling what i'm going to do now is very briefly give you an overview of what is the target hardware that we are looking at right so that in tomorrow's session i will be explicitly taking up vivado hls using it to synthesize an fft core and eventually after that what we will be doing is actually implementing the fft in first in simulation and then in hardware by actually putting it onto a platform that where there is going to be some kind of a processor sending data into your hardware module getting the data back after that and so on right so in order to understand that there are a couple of important aspects especially related to the terminology which i'll explain a little bit now and then a bit more tomorrow as well as on monday as we talk in more detail on the actual implementation details so when we talk about hardware implementation of a signal processing system the simplest and most straightforward is going to be this is the external world analog signal comes into an a to d converter or some kind of data converter in general right why i am saying data converter is because it might be a camera it might be something else which is not normally what you would think of as an analog to digital converter all that it's doing is taking some real world signal and converting it into data that can then be processed digital data 
this is going to be your computational module and the output of that computational module eventually goes into the opposite it takes your digital data and converts it back into something that can be used in the analog world it might be a control signal for how much to accelerate uh, electric car right or how fast a fan should turn or how quickly a robot should move or you know just basically how much should you amplify a signal uh, in order to decode it or demodulate it correctly any of those things right this is once again going back to the external world right but in practice and in fact in the systems that we are going to be working with very often rather than worrying about this external world we already have the data stored somewhere either in the memory of a computer or on a file somewhere in a file system of a computer or somewhere else it's essentially already available to you as data so you don't need to worry about how the data came what is important is in such a situation it often one way by which you can look at it is you are you already have the data available to you you are going to essentially put this through some kind of a cpu plus memory processing system right which once again gives out data which could be stored in memory or in a file and finally pushing it out to the external world is somebody else's problem you are not worried about that okay so the question becomes what does this cpu plus memory system look like and if i find that it is not working fast enough for me how do i augment it how do i improve it so that it can actually do the work that i need okay so for that we need to understand a little bit more about the layout and structure of a cpu plus memory system right essentially the core idea is very simple there is something called a cpu central processing unit the processor core essentially consists of some standard items which you are familiar with there's an arithmetic and logic unit there will be some register file there will be an instruction fetch unit and a program <coughs> counter that gets instructions from somewhere right so in other words there will be some kind of a program memory from which the cpu is getting instructions it will have its own internal register file etc right with which it communicates okay and all of this i am essentially going to black box it out and say you know this is just one unit out here what is important is this unit is then able to communicate with an external block of a large chunk of memory right how does this happen it communicates by means of something called a bus right and that bus essentially consists of a set of signals there is something called an address bus which basically tells me where in the memory i am pointing to okay and there is a data bus which says the actual content right so the address bus tells you the location in memory that you are trying to access the data bus has the content you are either trying to write something into that location in memory or you are trying to read something from it okay and any program ultimately if you look at it any variable that you declare right int i in a c program becomes some location in memory where some data is stored you can increment it you can add something to it you can check the value what it is you can compare it against something else but it is ultimately stored somewhere right if it is not something very small like a pro a counter for a loop then it usually goes into the actual memory if it is something very small the compiler may optimize it out and just sort of keep it in register files and never allocate memory for it okay but ultimately this is what a computer system looks like there is a cpu with its own program memory its own register file alu etc which communicates through a bus with an external memory unit what that means is in that memory unit i can store arrays of data and i can then read those arrays do some processing with them 
write the data back somewhere else and so on okay what we are going to do next is understand a little bit more about what is the implication of this bus what does it mean to have a bus of this sort what kind of memory can i access with a given bus and instead of memory if i want to access something else or if i want to talk to someone else some other module that i am creating how do i use the same kind of bus structure in order to accomplish that okay so we'll stop here for now and tomorrow we'll have a, another class it will be over here itself because i basically want to go over a demo of using vivado hls to create basic hardware units once we have created the hardware unit we will also then be going through in a little bit more detail on how to actually interface that with a processor and use it in order to accelerate certain computations